The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome. I'm saying welcome. You might not welcome the message. It might get a little difficult. It might get a little hot under the collar, but that's good for you. Uh, here's, here's the challenge that, that God's really revealed, and I believe you need to pay close attention because he's going to bring a supernatural impact in areas that you say you believe, but we're going to find out if there's really fruit in that area or not. Remember when the Lord gave me uh, in the school of the spirit revelation, he always used three things. He always, for me to test myself, he says, I'm going to give you a truth or a revelation. Then I'm going to teach you how to cultivate it so that you own it. And then I want you to evaluate to whether you see any fruit from it. That's, that's pure integrity and honesty, really. Those three things. Revelation, cultivate that revelation and then see if there's any fruit from it or is it just head knowledge? And, uh, Here's, here's what he started with this week. And I'm, I'm really preparing for a lot of biblically literate people. See, the, our calling, some people are called to evangelists, some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and then amongst them, there's all types of variations of their specific callings. Uh, ours was full stature. Ours was to put a flame under the, uh, and challenge the people for the reality of Jesus where you may have a orthodox theology, you don't really have a lot of real life experience with Jesus, all right? So that's full stature. Full stature is we're going to go from the child to the young man to the adult. And uh, the, the message today is uh, receiving supernatural acceptance. And you must absolutely put that word supernatural acceptance because there's a, a acceptance that comes from all types of carnality, uh, manipulations, uh, Titles, you know, that, that sort of thing, where people feel like uh, I must have the approval of certain people to feel good about myself. But that's not the acceptance I'm talking about. That's carnality. That's relying on the flesh to do something in you. Demands and expectations. But it's a far cry from the reality of supernatural acceptance that comes only from God the Father. This is not for lay people. This message would work absolutely of no value to an unsaved person because the acceptance I'm talking about comes from God. And you can either accept him or reject him. And we know for a fact there are plenty of people that reject him. And if they reject him, they'll reject you too. And so you better have supernatural acceptance. Okay. Um, here's the thought. And I want to start with this. If you're a note taker, write this down because this is going to be the challenge in the days ahead. Our culture is anti-Christian right now and getting more so. So here's the challenge. If Jesus didn't do another thing for you except the fact that your sins were forgiven, would you live for him and serve him all the days of your life? And that can't just be theory. You have to really let God search your heart to see if that's kind of a, a value that you have. If God never did another thing, and of course we know it. As a matter of fact, Jason taught last week on all of the rewards, the answer prayer, all the promises that are given uh, to the child of God. But I'm saying you need to approach it. Have you received the forgiveness of your sins as such a treasure that if he never did another thing for you, you would live for him and serve him. And, and uh, you know, don't fool yourself with some kind of delusion because, quite frankly, I've, I've seen and you've seen plenty of uh, backslidden Christians raised in the church. Come on, be honest. So it doesn't take that much for that not to be a reality. Therefore, the challenge is going to be, let's make that a reality. That if God never did another thing, and the only solution for that is supernatural acceptance. When you, you know, uh, people quote that scripture, um, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Night, height, nor depth, nor principalities, nor powers. Uh, nothing can separate me from the love of God. And the emphasis is on that 
God loves them that much. Well, yes, he does. But if that's a reality, then that would be your reciprocity. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. If he never did another thing in my life, I'm going to live for him and serve him all the days of my life. See, it's all in the approach of how you're looking at that. Are you looking at that scripture that he'll never let me go? That's good, and that's true. But at some point, when that is a reality, when that is written on the tablet of your heart, when that is not mere orthodox theology, you come to the place where reciprocity is that nothing can separate me from the love of God. I'm attached to him, and I'm going to live for him and serve him all the days of my life. And I'm saying that challenge, is, this, is not, this is not pie in the sky. This is something that clearly God has really dropped into my spirit to challenge the people of God, especially at Kingdom Life Church, because the days are coming. And as a matter of fact, everybody in Kingdom Life Church, I, well, you never say everybody, you never say always, you never say never. <laughs> you know? But everybody should know how to pray somebody through an emotional healing. And quite frankly, if you don't, you've missed the entire message of, of Kingdom Life Church Full Stature Ministries. Because our, our particular expertise is, I mean, I've heard uh, major leaders say, you know, physical healing is easier than emotional healing. That's major leaders in the body of Christ. And I'm saying emotional healings is, should be as easy as breathing for people who know how to function out of the secret place. If you try to do it from your head, yeah, you're going to be frustrated like a lot of believers. But that which comes from the heart is what works. Yeah. We love because he first loved us. You, you, you don't have anything to give unless you've received it. All right, We've said that over and over again, but I think it's got to sink in for the days ahead to prepare us for the hurting people that are going to be biblically literate but hurting. He heals the brokenhearted, and that's going to be a, a clarion call in the days ahead. And if that's kind of your DNA, fine. If that's not your DNA, you probably, I don't even know what you're doing here. If that's not your DNA, to see people get break free from the shackles that holds them back. They want to love God. They want to serve God. They know their Bible, and they're, they're not making it. They're struggling. There's a solution to everything. We had troubleshooting manuals. I think what we need is, uh, I want all my pastors to do this too, is be willing to work with anybody that has never prayed through an emotional healing themselves because they'll never pray someone else through something. You can't give something you don't have. And if it's not real to you, you're just going to give lip service to it. Now, uh, if, if God is, is speaking this supernatural acceptance and, and uh, uh, try to be as straightforward as possible, that's actually our strongest anointing. But it's not acceptance based on your likes and dislikes. It's acceptance based on Father God. And um, I want to cover some of that because there's all different ways we can approach this. We've got, we've got literature, too. We've got a, a wonderful short little, well, none of our booklets are short. Our publisher says, if they're any longer, I can't staple them. You know, your booklets are supposed to be stapled. And he says, I have to cut some pages out of here. I can't staple it. And that's... That's your uh, local publisher. Okay, so anyway, but there's a booklet on rejection, and I think uh, it wouldn't hurt if you have it at, uh, at home, if you have any of this material at home, look over it again, because you're going to see in the days ahead, um, this is going to come to the surface. Uh, Jason's already said on the school, people from around the world, don't forget, we got, uh, I don't know, what is it, 2,200 on the school now or more, and they put their input and that it's kind of like there is this emergence of this concept of what do I do with rejection and more and more people signing up for the rejection course. And I'm telling you, culture is doing it. And part of course it's the devil, but the devil uses culture and he uses people. And, and I'm convinced that we're living in a time when God told us to plant a church and, um, uh, I believe whatever's going to take place is going to be birthed right here in this little room. And then we'll see what happens after that. But he says, Malachi 4, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. In Luke 1.17, I believe it says, To make ready a people prepared for what's coming. Uh, there's all types of gifts in the body of Christ with, uh, with your uh, pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, 
pastors and teachers. But mine was always to know what to do in light of the time that we're living in. That was my strength. And it always has been, and I've got the track record to prove it. So if I'm saying something, I don't take it lightly, that this is something that we need to prepare for in the days ahead. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of Christians are going to have to make a choice whether they're going to go after God or they're going to fall by the wayside because of the pressure, mostly peer pressure. And believe it or not, you can find it in families. <laughs> huh? You got a lot, of, a lot of heads nodding right now. This is no different than when the Gentiles came to Jesus in the early church, first century church. All of a sudden, the enemies was in their own house. Their parents wanted to worship ten gods, and they found this Jesus as the Messiah. Don't tell me there wasn't conflict. Don't tell me all of your family's not going to love with you. And don't fall into Abraham's uh, trap where he was overly concerned with family to the point that it, it actually went to where it came against the plans and the purposes that God had for Abraham. You don't have a better idea. <laughs> God's got the right idea. But there's a turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children, children to the fathers. And if you want to, in a broad sense, uh, 45 years of ministry, and whenever I've dealt with people one-on-one, -on -one, I did that for years on a daily basis. Now God said, you trained enough people, they should be doing it. Multiply your efforts. It's not about you doing it to somebody. It's about you equipping people to do it. And if they're not interested, then they shouldn't be interested. Go someplace where you're interested. Then, But we want to help people. We want to see them grow up. We want to get them from, from orthodox Christianity to a real life in Jesus. Not going through the motions. Not dead works. We don't need that. Because it won't sustain you in the difficult times if it's not real. Ortho, you could be orthodox and dead in your theology. We want the life of God. Now, part of rejection, as far as a symptom, has to, a lot to do with the way you viewed mom and dad growing up, believe it or not. Because when you're, a, when you're really tiny, they're like God to you, right? They're, they're like, there's my safety, my security, my peace, everything in there. But we've had so many people grow up with dysfunctional Huh? Come on. <laughs> We're going to have to find out what God the Father is like, not your earthly father. And he might have been the best father in the whole world, but he wasn't God. And any, any judgments you've made, you will reap. Honor your mother and father that there be long life. With well, how do you honor someone that's dysfunctional? You forgive them. But you don't have to be manipulated by them. There's a big, big, big difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiveness is one way. It only takes one person. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They didn't all reconcile. We have to see that the forgiveness, love, and acceptance. When God took me to the school of the Spirit, matter of fact, I built a dome church. There's pictures in the bookstore. That dome church was representative that God said, when you plant the church, I only care about the atmosphere because the atmosphere is conducive to change and growth. That atmosphere had to be love, acceptance, forgiveness. And then he gave me that scripture out of Zechariah with shouts of grace to, when they brought the capstone uh, to, the, to the building of the temple. Love, acceptance, forgiveness, and grace. And then later on, as, as I said, that has to be, be taught, but that has to be functional. It has to be a reality. Love, acceptance, and forgiveness, and grace. And then I did a study on the work of the cross, uh, probably years after I had that revelation from God and was already starting. And God showed me that the work of the cross, or we call it four big words, but it's justification. You've heard that? Huh? Reconciliation propitiation, and regeneration. Oh, well, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what, justification, when properly done, is you know that you're loved. I'm just as if you never sinned. I'm loved, justified. Reconciliation, uh, you know that you are accepted in the beloved. I wasn't before because you have a choice. And from the, from the garden, man was rejected. God revealed an opportunity to come to him, but you can accept it or reject it.
but reconciliation means that you accepted it and it's a two-way relationship. It's not just that God said, I forgive Dennis. Dennis has to actually accept that forgiveness and receive it and be born again. So reconciliation covered that atmosphere that he wanted. Then he said propitiation. That's where he became sin for us. That's forgiveness. I know I'm going kind of fast with this. This isn't the central theme. This was just the beauty of watching God unfold at how important the atmosphere is in a local church. And quite frankly, I wouldn't want to be an Ananias and Sapphira in the days ahead. I wouldn't want to be a phony in the congregation, you know, because you, you will be singled out by God and you will be dealt with. It's not time to play games. This is a time to where Jesus is Lord of your life. Then act like it. Take that truth, cultivate that truth, and then let's see if there's any fruit to it. Now, he said, um, propitiation, forgiveness. And regeneration, how'd you get saved? By grace, through faith. It's a gift of God. So all of a sudden, I saw that a genuine work of the cross, understanding those four words, it's not as important as understanding the work of the cross. Justification, reconciliation, propitiation, regeneration, all of that is a genuine work of the cross that produces love, acceptance, forgiveness, and grace. That's what's on the other side. And grace is empowerment. More and more people are coming. Uh, fortunately, we taught this years ago, but more and more people are coming to the forefront that it's not just uh, favor. It's not just unmerited. The more people are doing word studies, they're finding out uh, grace is empowerment. Grace is the divine enablement to obey God. Grace is the ability to be and to do all that he called you to be and all that he called you to do. Oh, we're not going to get through with this. This is too good. I have 9,000 pages. I don't think we'll cover all 9,000 today. But this... This is coming from my life, though. These are scriptures validating the radical change that I saw. Because here, uh, fathers are important, but that, uh, when it comes from a, 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 a pastor, it sounds like it's self-serving. But in reality, I can see the need from the days when I'm going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. The children to the, there has to be a reason for that. There has to be orphans out there. There has to be people who do not have a revelation of a spiritual father, and they still view God the way they viewed their earthly father. You've got a long ways to go in your maturity. You need some healing. If you still view God the way you viewed your earthly father, if he was tough and a tyrant, and you see God as a tough and a tyrant, it's very clear that you're not walking in the level of revelation that you need. Same with mothers. All right? But... The key is, because we're looking for the acceptance of the Father, total and absolute supernatural, say that word with me, supernatural acceptance. Because <laughs> otherwise it's just a game. Otherwise it's just manipulation. Supernatural acceptance. The heart of revelation to the church is that God is your Father. Our Father. That's where it begins with the Lord's Prayer. Our that's the heart revelation of the church, is that God is a father. Um, Jesus said the, the basis of his ministry was not, I'm here to reveal myself as God. That's not what he did, did he? I'm here to reveal the father. If you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the father. So it's the heartbeat of revelation. And I believe that in times when the prophetic movement is saying God's doing something radical in the church and it's time to make ready a people prepared, repentance is always the precursor, always, no exception. And so what I'm saying is repent so that the times of refreshing can come from the presence of the Lord. But uh, Thomas even said to him in John 14, Lord, we don't know where you're going and how can we know the way? Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's going to be through that relationship the Father is going to be revealed. Uh, and 1 Corinthians 4, this always sells, sounds self-serving when it comes from a pastor. But I can't help it. That's the way God made it, right? So I'm not going to apologize for it. But in 1 Corinthians 4.15, and this very often is the case, 
there's leaders that have a need to be seen and heard, and there's leaders that want to reproduce quality children, sons and daughters. I'm not really interested in someone who's interested in fluff or a deep teaching or something that tickles their ear, can't relate to other people, don't know how to relate to other people. They're dysfunctional. There's healing for all of that. But 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15 says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors, you do not have many fathers. And remember the first century church in the Didache, what they say? Your natural father can bring you into this world, but there are spiritual mentors and fathers that will teach you how to live in this world, in the spirit. And you need you appreciate both, but you need to know there is both. And some, some that were raised without a father, some that were raised under difficult situations, to this day, I don't see I see them have trouble with authority in, in all the realms, business, church, everywhere. You know what? That could be dealt with. And you could get a change of perspective because God changes hearts. He really does. But though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many. Uh, actually, that word I always thought was fascinating. Boy leaders. How about that? For though you might have 10,000 boy leaders, instructors, you do not have many fathers. What would cause a boy leader to come up? Someone that needed to be seen and heard. Someone who operated in their gifts and uh, the gifts were more important than their character. Boy, I loved it when we were trained up uh, under uh, Bishop Hammond. I never in, in 20 some years had a, a in, in those days we could afford it. It was a bigger church. <laughs> We'd have guest speakers. We'd have prophets come in. I never, I would fill out a form about that prophet and send it back to their headquarters. What was his behavior like? How did he handle money? What was his morals like? What was his marriage like? Most people are just loosey-goosey. I've got a gift. Watch me minister to you. Matter of fact, that's the first red flag. Anyone that comes to this church and says, uh, I can minister to yeah. Why don't you sit and build a relationship? Why don't you know these people first before you <coughs> flaunt your gift? I'm not impressed with your gift. Some people say, Pastor, what's my gift? And I'd say, start loving people, and I'll tell you what your gift is. Let me see you in action. Because if it's not coming from love, it's not worth it anyway. Now, though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many boy leaders. That was my introduction. <laughs> fathers. You don't have many fathers. Though you have many 10,000 boy leaders, you don't have many fathers. I must be from the old school because I don't see it happen today. I was a baby Christian, knew that I was going to pastor, and I hung out with, um, and th they knew that I was called, and I was always young Dennis. And you know that ain't true now. Okay. <laughs> I was young Dennis, and I hung out weekly with six pastors, saved a lot of aggravation, learned all the tricks that Christians do, whether they mean to or not, all the churchianity and the phoniness and how to identify it, especially that Jezebel spirit, you know. And uh, learned a lot from them. Most of what I learned from them, and still to this day learned from myself, was from the mistakes, right? Not sometimes the best teacher, do it wrong first. <laughs> then you go, young man, you don't, young woman, you don't want to do it that way. <laughs> All right. But I, I want to give the backdrop, and the people that have been with me a long time, they, they know this already, but this, this uh, uh, video goes out to people that never listen to any of our stuff. And I want them to know that uh, my father was illegitimate, and he was ashamed to my grandfather. He had many other brothers and sisters growing up. And my grandfather could acknowledge all of the siblings except my dad. When my dad would come in front of him, it was like a haze would come over and he couldn't see him. He's an unsaved man, didn't know how to deal with his shame. So what he did was, I'm ashamed. He's a walking entity of my sin whether I believe in sin or not, I'm ashamed. I don't want nobody to know that he was illegitimate. 
So I make him invisible. Some of you may have been raised that way. They were there, but they weren't there. <laughs> well, guess what happened? My dad stayed invisible his whole life. And then this, is, this works generationally, you know. When I was born, and I have two younger sisters, my dad could see my two younger sisters, but I was invisible. And thank you, Jesus, that I got what I got from the Father. Because some people will spend their entire life trying to get the affection, the attention, the delight. When I prayed Jennifer through this, that was hers. That she saw God the Father, saw Jennifer as his constant delight. But growing up, you're never good enough. She was intelligent, so her father set the bar at an impossible height, thinking that's doing the best interest for you. But all it did was say, you're, you'll never mount. You'll never achieve. You'll never accomplish anything. What a waste, what a waste of an intellect. Well, if that's all you know, you would have to come into a supernatural acceptance from God that isn't like dad. And I can hear people saying, well, I had a great mother and father, but they weren't God. And trust me, that didn't mean that you don't need to still deal with this because you weren't necessarily the best child. <laughs> so there's no wiggle room here. <laughs> All right. So anyway, um, all the emotional hurts and wounds that are suffered in life, rejection is probably the deepest of all. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jennifer did a study and she said scientifically, the emotion rejection hurts. It registers in the brain as if it were physical pain. And it's the initial sin. When they sinned in the garden, what were they? What did God do? I have to reject you. And they covered themselves, and they hid. They did all the stuff that people do. They faked it. <laughs> Blamed other people. And you know, the blame game, if you're a real Christian, you don't do blame game. That's the easiest indication of someone who's not very mature. Well, so-and-so, you, you don't know about so-and-so. Well, so-and-so, that's the blame game. And it's carnal. Here's the way it works. Uh, I learned this from Jennifer, too. She has all these cute little stories of country stuff that I would never do. Like, for one, walk barefoot outside. I don't, I don't do that. But anyway, <laughs> she says, you're walking barefoot through a field, enjoying the day, and suddenly your toe hits a sharp rock with excruciating pain. It goes like this without even thinking. Pain, anger, blame. How could I be so dumb to hit the only rock in the field? Where's that farmer that left this rock in the field? Why did God, oh yeah, that's a good one. Why did God let me hit the only rock that was in the field? Pain, anger, blame. That is total carnality. You do anything like that. And, and here's one of the telltale signs. You've got some rejection issues in there dormant, if nothing else. They always, you never... Huh? Come on, have you ever been in a heated little argument where you use that one? You never, you always. That is a pure indication that for one thing, it's not even realistic. <laughs> Nobody always, I mean, so even the really bad people don't do it all the time. Sociopaths, serial killers, they don't do it all the time. They do it often. <laughs> but... Rejection is universally, it's feared, you know, because the pain is so deep. And uh, by the way, when God created us, male and female, human beings were created for a relationship. You can say you don't need anybody. That's a sign of rejection, too. You've got a core rejection. I don't need anybody. I'm happy all by myself. Mm -hmm. 
but you're made for society. And as social beings, you crave belonging and acceptance. So even if you say you don't need anybody, there's something that you're doing, some sinful behavior to receive, to feel like good about yourself. There's something I'm trying to make myself feel good. Remember, the carnal lie is I must have either certain people feel good about me in order for me to feel good. Well, welcome to real life. That was, that was one of my first revelations. It got me on the rejection healing. Is when I got saved, I went to a little church and I was a few weeks old. And I loved God and I loved all these people. And it didn't take long before I found out they don't all love you. <laughs> wow. The audacity. <laughs> but you know what? When, when God showed me how my dad was and he took me through that and I released forgiveness and some of you are watching you'll need to do this I release forgiveness to him but not just forgiveness I released any demand or expectation for him to ever ever accept me and I opened wide the gate for it to come directly from God but you're not going to get a supernatural experience directly from God if you won't open the way and get rid of the demands and expectations. I will make him notice me. I probably did that as a little kid. I made my dad notice me. Just kept Dennis the menace. Just kept, hey, here I am. Oh, I got in trouble again. Yep. Did you notice that? <laughs> All right. That is not the right way to do it, by the way. I'm sure, I'm sure I did, though. Um, and living in a family with parents... Uh, is community. He's trying to teach community. And you can have all kinds of excuses. You don't need that. But in reality, God made you that way. So you're actually fighting against the new creation reality. He assigns people to a flock, not just friends. Oh, by the way, that's a rejection technique that people, you Christians use. Well, I'm just friends with everybody, but I, there's no church I consider my flock. That's rejection, actually. It's, it's a, it's a built-in safety mechanism that therefore I can't get hurt or rejected. Good luck. <laughs> You're going to find rejection and hurt one way or another. Why not get the acceptance, that supernatural acceptance from God and get it dealt with properly? But living in a family with parents and siblings teaches a child how to live in community. Some of us learned it better than others, <laughs> okay, right? But that's where you learn, right? This is, this is where you do it right and wrong in community. The school environment teaches you how to live in a life. Actually, most behavior from some adults were things they should have learned. Who was that guy? You should have learned this in kindergarten. Don't touch other people's stuff. Don't poke people. Put your stuff away when you're done. Just think if adults did that. <laughs> wow, you'd have community. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> forming bonds with others is actually a fundamental need. And it's the dread of rejection that's common to everyone at some level. Forming bonds. Who do I trust? Trust is earned, too. Most creatures get what they need to live from their physical surrounding. Humans, in contrast, get what they need from each other and their culture. And that's why this message, I think, is so important right now. Because culture is changing the value system of even Christians. And uh, we need each other and we need culture. Uh, I noticed that for a small little church like we are, I know one thing. Um, in a lot of areas, we're on the same page, culturally. And I find that very refreshing. I would like people to think for themselves so we don't uh, coerce anyone to a, a, a form of belief. But it's interesting that you start to hear people and they say, you know what, these people are stable. You know what, these people have... Uh, have not lost the ability to think. These people are not necessarily brainwashed by culture. Influence, varying at level degrees, but we're not brainwashed by culture. Now, 
you know, in the Garden of Eden, <laughs> life must have been great in the Garden of Eden. I mean, you had love and peace, harmonious relationship, perfect health, no lack, an uninterrupted sense of belonging. Mm, you want that? You can have it. An uninterrupted sense of belonging. And by the way, when I released forgiveness to my father, I'm going to jump ahead um, because this is too good. Um, when I released forgiveness to my father, uh, God started flooding me with the scriptures and it was like he took, uh, you know, like an engram, uh, it was like it was carved. You know, it says, let the word be written on the tablet of your heart. I felt like he took one of those hammers and tsh, and he put accepted. And it was like, and God said, nobody can take that away because I put it there. You received it, you own it. And no one can take away that acceptance. I am accepted in the beloved. And then he just flooded me, and I cried for, for hours and probably days on and off because he kept saying, Dennis, my thoughts are continually toward you. They're more numerous than the grains of the sands of the sea. All of these scriptures, constantly. Yes, even while you're sleeping, I'm still thinking. I, I've never had that kind of attention. I wasn't even bad. That was the only time I did get attention. I got a good smack when I was bad. <clears throat> But God's telling me, he's thinking, and I'll tell you what, you know when it's real? And I want you to pay close attention to this. If you're a note taker, you better write this down. Otherwise, this is just theory, Orthodox Christianity, Scripture. But when it's real, when it's real, everything in you wants to reciprocate. When it's not real, well, I hope so, or I'd like that, it'd be nice. But until you want to reciprocate, because... We love because he first loved us. So you're not going to love God with your human love. That means nothing. You're going to love him with the agape love, the supernatural love. We love because he first loved us. That also suggests something we teach that set a lot of people free over the years. That suggests that it is no longer I who live, but Jesus, the Messiah, who lives through me. Right? That suggests it is no longer I who forgive, but Jesus the Messiah, the forgiver in me, going through me. I have to receive it before I can give it, and I can't give something I don't own. It also suggests that it's <clears throat> no longer I who love, but Jesus the Messiah who loves in me. Love, forgiveness, Life is no longer I who live. All of these suggest that it must be received before it can be given. It has to be real. It needs to be written on the tablet of your heart. And the proof is, if that's a true revelation of the scripture, and it was cultivated properly, the fruit should be reciprocity. You should automatically have it flow out of your heart a want to. That's why I says, Nothing can separate me from the love of God, neither height nor depth. Oh, that's nice to say if you're thinking in terms that God loves you that much. You've got to get it to the point where nothing can separate me from the love I have toward God, neither height nor depth, anything. Paul had it. He was willing to go to hell for the brethren. I was accepted in the beloved and I received that acceptance from God. And it was, it was so amazing because rejection just didn't... It, in other words, it, when someone rejected me after that ministry, I felt their hurt. They're the victim. And if they only knew how They'd be embarrassed if they only knew how obvious they were in the spirit realm. If you're walking in acceptance and somebody rejects you, they can do it sweetly too. You know, but if it ain't real, it's not real. Biological fathers model 
But whatever they modeled, you better get the real thing from God the Father. That's how you honor mother and father. You honor them by forgiving them. You don't honor their bad behavior. That's overkill. And that's non-redemptive. Well, well, they meant, uh, this is the thing I usually hear. When people need healing, even on parental uh, oversight, they have a tendency to say, oh, well, they did the best they could. There's a half-truth in that. They probably did do the best they could in light of their dysfunction. <laughs> But that's not making you receive from God. That's making an excuse for someone else. Rejection hurts like physical pain when compared to all the other negative emotions. And the emotional toll of rejection, it feels like I've been tossed on a rubbish heap. Uh, we feel though we've been discarded as a failure of a human or as a human being. We feel as though our best efforts to maintain a relationship have somehow been unsatisfactory. Most of that is self-analysis and based on poor me. <clears throat> In reality, if you got your acceptance from God, none of those would be an issue. It would be, oh, that's too bad. They're hurting. That's too bad. I'd administer to them. But they don't want it. Acceptance doesn't mean you demand that they reconcile. You demand that they accept your standard. Jesus had the perfect standard. Not everybody accepts that, right? They have to make their own choice. But <clears throat> being alienated, uh, it can be particularly devastating for those that were raised without it. As a matter of fact, there's even a, a chemical imbalance. What is that, Jennifer, that, uh, uh, like an adopted child? Oxytocin. Oxytocin for bonding. So if you adopt a child that's not had the love and nurture of caring parents that held them, it will take them longer to make an attachment. Because you got it. Trust has to prove itself over a period of time. You don't adopt a child and then say, I'll pick you up from school and then don't show up. Because they will form, yep, we'll see what's happening here. There's churches filled with pastors and leaders who use people, destroy relationship because they're driven to succeed. And that's not just true in churches, that's true in all businesses. I know probably the most difficult thing <clears throat> would be for a Christian business where people get paid. You wonder how many are doing this for the paycheck, uh, like a Christian school, and how many love these kids? and see it as a ministry. That, that's something that if your acceptance was in God, and what was the challenge today? If the only thing God ever did for me was forgive me my sins, never did another thing, I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. And if the acceptance was unconditional, like he said it was, it's supernatural. And it's written on the tablet of your heart. No one can take it away. People can reject you, but so what? It'll be like, oh, you need ministry. Oh, because it's almost always has anger attached to it. The only time anger is justified is when you're confronting sinful behavior. And that anger has to be at the evil, not the person. Being alienated. You know, we did a message not too long ago, but it might be good for some people to review those that can go back on YouTube. I don't even know if it's there. But I saw the value of understanding this. We have four fathers. We have the potential for four fathers. If you were born, you had a father somewhere. You had a natural father. You got God the Father. 
They're spiritual fathers. And then Jesus told the Pharisees, your father's the devil. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. You don't, we don't want that, Father. Okay, we don't want that one. We got saved. <laughs> but those other ones are necessary. Like I said, it always sounds self-serving when the pastor talks about spiritual fathers. But quite frankly, I had them my whole life. And to this day, uh, some of the most beautiful things that have ever transpired in my life came out of his lips toward me. Because there's just something, there's just something about that kind of encouragement. I can remember one time he just said, Young Dennis, I like you. That was pretty simple. But you know, hearing that from a successful man of God that people looked up to was a true spiritual father. When he uh, he wanted to start a network of pastors, there were 200 that literally showed up running because he had a fatherly approach. But a fatherly approach is not to be mistaken with motherly approach. Ah, some like the mother part better. Mm -hmm. oh, the little kids, they all have a jelly sandwich, and I packed all their lunches, and I sent them off to school, and I hugged them, and I made sure that they felt good about themselves. We need that. But a father is supposed to pull the gold out of you. He's supposed to challenge you to rise to the occasion and be all that you could be and get into full stature and quit being a baby Christian your whole life. No whining, no complaining. And this, this spiritual father here, I have no toleration for venting. Venting to me means you're not even saved. Venting is complaining. They died in the wilderness for that. Venting means you don't know how to redemptively solve anything. You only know how to complain and talk about other people. Maybe in the world I punch a pillow, feel better. I can understand that. When I was unsaved and lived on the street and somebody gave me a hard time and I punched them, I felt a lot better. Until you get guilty. I can still remember the one time I punched a kid when I was in the third grade. He was the one in the second grade that when I was alone standing by my tree, you know, the tree of rejection. Here was the way my rejection worked back then. It was like my mother would say, have you made any friends yet? No but you've been in school for weeks now. Why haven't you made any friends? She said, are you trying? I'm trying, I'm trying. I do the same thing. And she goes, what's that? I go stand by myself by a tree and wait for someone to come up to me. That doesn't work. Except one time they were playing softball and the ball got away and it rolled right by me standing by my little lonesome tree. And Lenny Adams, that was his name, never forgot. He came and he goes, hi. I grabbed the ball, ran back and played softball. Lenny Adams said hi. Years later, when I'm a teenager, found out he was messing with my girlfriend and I punched him. And it felt good at the time, but later it was like, that was Lenny Adams. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only guy that said hi to me in the second grade. See, there's guilt, pain, anger, blame, but then there's guilt. And if you don't know how to properly deal with guilt, you're in trouble. What do people do when they, they, they refuse to deal properly biblically with guilt through repentance and confession? They blame. Makes them feel momentarily better. But that's a carnal solution, and it's really not even factual. Uh, rejection is like physical pain and we're going to receive that supernatural affection. The only way to break this sense of rejection is for people to be filled with a sense of the Father's love. This prepares us to become mature, 
sons and daughters, which is our ministry, mature, full stature, not babies. Babies, go somewhere else if you need coddled, if you need mama, because you're going to be fathered here more than mama. You need mama, because if it's genuine, you will get that. But you're not going to get that at the expense of growing up. Hmm? You, otherwise, if you don't, if you just mother them, they'll be living in your basement well into their 60s. You don't, <laughs> you don't want that. You need mothering and fathering. You need the love and care, but you need to pull the gold out. you got to be a gold miner. The divine nature on the insides needs to come forth for them to be all that they can be and to do all that they can do. The grace of God is there. You don't want any other plan. I just saw that the um, probably the greatest curse of the day, that's why I would say this is a deliverance service, is rejection. It's going to take spiritual parents. Oh, that. See, um, but I've seen multitudes would rather just be friends with everybody than have spiritual parents because it still rings a bell of that didn't work for me. I had parents, and that didn't work for me. Uh, but it will take spiritual parenting. And in the church, we're actually reparenting to whosoever will. Reparenting is saying, here's the way God would do it. I don't know how you had it happen. Okay? But here's the attitude you have to have toward them. To get set free, you've got to honor them. Not their bad behavior, but you honor them by forgiving them and releasing them from any demands, expectations, or judgments. And excuses. while well, they did the best they could. You know. Only when a person is healed of the fatherlessness through the love of God is rejection broken so that they can begin to enter the process of mature sonship. Turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers. Sonship is so important that all creation is presently crying out for the manifestation of mature sons of God. That's coming to the forefront now. But, listen to this. If you're a note taker, write this one down. You must be a son or daughter unto the father before you can be a father unto sons. I'm talking spiritually. Anybody can father a child. I'm talking about in the kingdom of God, a supernatural transaction that needs to take place. You must be a son to the father before you can be a father to son. So we're going to need a revelation of the love of the father toward us, yes. But we're going to not be satisfied until we reciprocate and that father's heart goes out toward people. Until it's out. Turning. There has to be a turning of the hearts of the Father. It involves repentance, yes, but there, it's talking about a transaction, a supernatural transaction to where fathering is you're no longer little children, you're no longer young men and women, but you are mothers and fathers in Jesus. That level of maturity, third level of the cross. Rejection operates out of insecurity and jealousy. Acceptance functions out of belonging. You know when God did that work for me? I could still hear it in my head to this day. Once I saw that his thoughts were continually toward me, and that it was written on the tab of my heart, and there was a stamp approved, written, and I can't wash it away, and neither can anybody else. <laughs> That's nice to know, because I can be my own worst enemy. So for me, that was great revelation. And you can't do nothing about it. Too bad. It's on there. You're, it's a permanent tattoo on your spirit that you are accepted in the beloved. And you know what came out of my mouth? And this is what I want to flow out to you today. I want this to rise up on the inside of you. I belong. <laughs> and because I belong, I've got a lot to give. That's not coming from my flesh. It's coming out of the belonging. I belong, and because I belong, I've got a lot to give. So many people are based on their uh, vocation, trophies, accomplishments, 
all of that's going to somehow give them acceptance. Forget it. If God never did another thing for you, if you were of no reputation, you made yourself of no reputation, have this mind that was in Jesus. Say, but I belong. And because I belong, I got a lot to give. And if that's real in your personal life, it will show horizontally. You, you relate to God the way you relate to people. You relate to people the way you relate to God. I belong, therefore I got a lot to give. I am not striving to earn the Father's approval. It's written on the tab of my heart. I can't erase it. Neither can anybody else. I belong. We have already know we're accepted. And when we serve other people, it's not out of our gifting. We serve out of that acceptance. Because then you're flowing, you're flowing out of the reality of the transformation in you. You're ministering life and transformation into people's hearts and lives. Rejected individuals try to medicate deep internal alienation through works. Some of the hardest working people will be people that suffer from rejection because they're trying to compensate. I liked uh, Jason had the, uh, the definition of worry the other week. Worry is an indication you're trying to do beyond what you're able to do and you're saying, what I've done so far is not enough, even though I've done all. <laughs> it's still not enough. Yeah, no, that's playing God. Stop it. <laughs> that was Bob Newhart's solution to all counseling. For five dollars, I can re resolve all of your all that ails ails you. Stop it. That'll be five dollars. Thank you. And the only time it didn't work was that one lady. I'm sorry, but it didn't work yet. I'm still afraid of confined places. He said, okay, that's another $5. I'm going to put you in a box and bury you in the deep thing. Stop it. <laughs> All right. But that's what some people actually, as foolish as that sounds, that's how people deal with their stuff. That's how they deal with rejection. They, they, they... Anybody else's comment is not a reflection of you. That's a sign of rejection. When someone makes a comment and you take it personal, guess what? They might have said that to anybody. You just happen to be there. That is a clear indication that rejection's got to go. So, Father, right now, we're going to pray for deliverance on this. Oh, boy. Oh, there's so much good stuff. I suggest you get the booklet. We have a rejection booklet that would be really helpful in this time and season um, in the bookstore uh, and online. But Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I, I'm we're believing for deliverance for whosoever really wants to receive forgiveness. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I receive forgiveness for all of that rejection that I've taken in and owned. Cleanse me. I release demands and expectations on everyone who ever rejected me. No demands or expectations on them. And now, Father, I ask you to open up into my heart and receive that divine acceptance. I'm receiving the acceptance in the name of the Lord Jesus. You've been Amen. listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.